President Trump's election was just a general discontent within society. And what I mean by that, I think all people in society, regardless of whether you're in the middle, to the left, or to the right, have a general feeling that our society is going in the wrong direction. And they're really concerned about this experiment of democracy called the United States of America. And I think society is really concerned, what are we leaving our children and our grandchildren? And that general discontent was spoken to by President Trump, because he said, I'm going to drain the swamp, I'm going to make America grand again, I want to do things differently. And I think a lot of people latched on to that. Do you think there's an agenda that's pretty clear as to what that means in terms of policy, those three terms? You know, I think it's, it's not real clear. I think it generally means uh, less government, less government intrusion in people's lives. Beyond that, I'm not sure you could really define it. So the conundrum is, is a, and this appeared with, with Reagan, uh, even with Nixon, is a conservative, a compassionate conservative, right. as with the kind of social legislation that President Nixon pushed through, uh, to his credit. It is, yeah. I mean, lawyers are professional, and they're taught to come in and do their job, argue their cases, and win or lose, they're taught to continue to move on because there's going to be another case down the road. And so lawyers are kind of famous, and they still do it in Billings, Montana, where they'll confront each other and, and argue uh, pretty vigorously in the courtroom, and then they'll go out and have a beer together. And that's the way it should be. That's the way politics should be. You know, I like the, the story about Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. They would argue vehemently on issues, but then they could go out and have dinner, dinner and a beer together. And to me, that's what politics should be all about. Do you have an explanation? Or satisfaction? Unless you've got some intrigue about you. And whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, they're fun people to get to know. And so I really enjoy that aspect of getting to know people. And I've been told that doesn't happen as much anymore. And you know, so that's only been 25 years. And if that's the case, that's very disappointing. Well, probably David and I share an explanation at the national level for the partisanship. I think both of us are curious, what's the reality in Montana? Is this, are we just a reflex of the national scene now? Or does Montana still have a core that is different? Well, I don't know. I think Montana can be different. I think, um, you know, I think this last legislative session, and I wasn't up there, but again, I heard it was much better than the previous session. And, and Republicans and Democrats still fought when they not needed to fight, but they got along, typically. And so, I'm an optimist. I still think there's hope. Okay. That was pretty darn intense. We had the, uh, the blacklisting of Hollywood actors and actresses. That was pretty darn intense. So, maybe it is, but I'm not completely convinced of that. And during the 60s, we suddenly had the Civil Rights Revolution and, 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 and protesting on the streets and people being shot and fires fires and destruction of property that was very intense. And I think something in the 70s known as Vietnam had an right. impact. Right. It was intense. I was thinking of the 30s. I don't know how close. Hooverville. I mean, that was very intense. Montana had very significant opposition to FDR. Yes. And uh, I worked on ranches and I remember one farmer I worked for who wouldn't, he and his wife still wouldn't speak to several of their neighbors because they took handouts. See, there you go. So, in relative terms, is it really any worse? I'm not sure. Yeah. It's an interesting so, point. Uh, Actually, I feel a little shiver down my back. You're the first person who uh, we've interviewed, and you're at the tail end of our series, who has said that. And I'm a, pretty much a student of history, and, uh, although my degree's in political science, but I, I feel the same way. I wasn't there in 1490, nor was I there when the Enlightenment hit in the 16th century. 
but those are very intense times. Absolutely. So my sense is, what about the, how to put this? I guess the words that crop in mind, the nature of law now, as it affects Montanans. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of criticism of Jan Forte. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing his name right. They're close. For uh, not <clears throat> observing uh, the common law in Montana that access should be. And the media made a big to do, the Democrats made a big to do with that. Was that a uh, unique Montana attitude, or is that something that was sort of drilled in by the national <clears throat> press and the national Democrats? Well, let's start with the foundation, which fortunately the United States is a nation of laws, not of men. And that's a huge foundation to begin with because, you know, before the king was not subject to the law and the United States is kind of the epitome of the rule of law. And that's very important to remember that. And so when you mention somebody by name, like Congressman Gianforte, it implies that there was maybe special treatment or he was trying to receive special treatment. But at the end of the day, he didn't. And nobody does. Even if you're a president of the United States from either party, you still have to follow the law. And so I think we're very fortunate that we have that rule of law. And yes, it is, the boundaries are pushed or they tried to be pushed, but we have that foundational core of the judiciary, which is there to follow the law and make sure men follow the law. So again, at the end of the day, as long as we continue to adhere to our constitution and the rule of law, yes, we're gonna have pushback, but I think we're gonna be in good stead to make sure we're a nation of laws, not of men. The partisanship that emerged in those, you know, I've seen some of the political cartoons way back from the 18th century 19th century and they're horrible you know really bombastic and so I know we always think the current situation is worse than it's ever been but people are people and honestly I'm not sure if it's in relative terms any worse than it's ever been it seems like it I agree but I'm not really sure that's the case. It's important. Well, they're all justifying their decisions by saying this is what the Constitution tells me to decide. And that was just as true of Justice O'Connor as it is of Justice uh, Alito. Well, everybody tries to rationalize their decisions. I certainly understand that. And I haven't followed Judge Gorsuch's career in the months that he's been up there that closely. And to really answer your question on how he's doing, I'd have to do that. But I take him at face value until it's shown otherwise that his agenda up there is to follow the law. And if he does that, then I'd be happy. Do you think this is a nation of Christian law? I think the background is Christian Judeo ethics. I don't think they're Christian laws, but I think we're certainly founded on Christian Judeo ethics. The country is open. Have uh, the cases that you decided been appealed? Yes. And, and um, what, is there any impact uh, of an appeal when you're sitting as a judge? No. Did they get, have you had some go to the Montana Supreme Court? Oh, of course. So trying to give you the big picture, I've handled about 25,000 cases in my time as a judge. And probably, and I don't know the exact numbers, but probably around 200 have been appealed to the Montana Supreme Court. And roughly uh, three quarters are affirmed and a quarter are not. And so, but at the end of the day, again, my job is to follow the law and that's all I've tried to do. And sometimes the Supreme Court sees it differently. And it's been interesting because of those cases, especially when they've been overturned, sometimes I think, yep, you know, they're right. I didn't see that in the heat of battle and upfront and personal, I didn't see that. And sometimes I think they didn't get it, they didn't understand where I was coming from, and they're wrong. But at the end of the day, they're last. So that's the way it works, and I, I accept that system. Uh -huh. Liberals, I'll okay. let others decide whether they're more liberal or not. Um, again, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, they have reverse precedent more 
not recently, but maybe a decade ago, they were reducing or reversing precedent more than previous courts had. So that is troublesome to me, but I'm gonna let others judge that. Jeff Renz, who's a law professor at University of Montana, did a really fascinating study on the Supreme Court. And if you're interested, you should look at the study and maybe talk to Jeff Renz about that. He's, oh. over, he's over in Missoula. Judge, just a just trying to help out for a moment. Uh, I think you meant to say you, you don't like labels. What did I say? Liberals. I'm sorry, I don't like labels. Yeah, no, you were starting to, I just wanted to thank give you. you a chance to <laughs> make I sure. I didn't speak every now and then because I'm thinking ahead, so yeah. thank you for the correction. No, I just, I, I knew that's what you meant, I but was, since I'm, we're video I'm recording you. Thank you. Because <laughs> it didn't sound like you. No, thank you. No, I, uh, I like you. liberals, I like conservatives, yeah, I no. like people. Right, no, I, <laughs> just helping out. I appreciate that. I have a, uh, you did, we talked to, Number. Right. So that's pretty typical, but nothing beyond that. I don't think of anything. So you're not in that 5%. You might be. I mean, 30 times is a lot. I am. The society spends a lot of money on me. And yeah. they did my brother, who right. had Alzheimer's, I care for. Yeah. We're both veterans. We both benefited from that for health care. But uh, I'm very concerned. Uh, not that old folks don't get their share. They get more than their share. Right. And little... The little tads coming on of all colors don't get their fair share from my point of view. And how does a compassionate conservative deal with that when the political pressure comes from our age group? You know, I think the answer is, is difficult to define, but I think it comes with balance. I mean, we just have to look at the big picture and try to do the best we can. As I said, we are a benevolent society. I think we do really want to take care of those that can't take care of themselves. but. In my opinion, you know, we can't continue to spend money we don't have. And 50 out of 55 of the last budgets have been in deficit. Well, that's not sustainable. You as a person know that. And the problem is we're passing on this debt to our children and our grandchildren. We're not being realistic about our situation. And it's going to come to some sort of a horrendous stop when all of a sudden creditors don't want to give us credit anymore. And I don't know what that's going to look like. But there's no doubt in my mind that at some point that's going to happen. And so we need to get our arms around that. And I believe Americans are also resilient. And if everybody feels like they're, they're helping with the solution and giving their fair share, they're willing to tighten their belts. I think all of us are willing to tighten our belts if we know our neighbors are also tightening their belts. And somehow we need to have a national discussion about that. But when we continue the deficit spending, and that's just sort of the big picture, we all know in our hearts that's not sustainable. Is part of the problem uh, what we're doing abroad? I mean, we, we've, we've just, tried to be a beacon of freedom and democracy and liberty across the world, and I think that's been a very positive thing. I think we've been too intertwined in other people's, other countries, you know, civil wars and, and, and civil discussions. I know I was thinking when we were in the United States of America and we had our civil war, we didn't want England and France to come over and choose sides. And they try tried. To, they tried, but we didn't want them to. And I don't think you know, the Middle East countries really want us to be meddling in their affairs. And I know we want to do the right thing. The question is, what's the right thing? It is. That's a very good point. Do you, do you have the feeling that we've been involved in more wars than we should have been? I have the feeling that we have been involved in more wars than we should have been. Should we not have gone into Vietnam? Well, I mean, 2020 hindsight's perfect. Um, I don't think we should have been involved in Vietnam, yes. How about Iraq? I guess I'm not sure. I'm, I'm skeptical that we should have been. What was our motivation? Was it truly to help the people, or was it to protect the oil supply? And I don't know what our motivation was. If it was truly to help the people, then that was a good reason. Ostensibly, they have weapons of mass destruction. Right. The right. So never will be. The question should be, would I want my son or daughter to go over to this foreign land to fight in this war? And if the conclusion is, yes, it's important enough to have my son or daughter there, then perhaps it is important enough. But if it's no, that's not important enough for my son or daughter, then it probably isn't important enough. 
We have a few minutes. I, I'm concerned about your time. I appreciate that. I have to be at work at eight, so thank you. It's going very well. I'm not sure we told you what this is about. You didn't really tell about our home state. We've, he's had a lot of experience in Missouri. I've had quite a bit of experience in the last 20 years in the state of Washington. I was, uh, my favorite city is Washington, D.C. I taught there for years and mm -hmm. I lived there and, and I was in the military and I have a lot of respect for what people try to do there. So I, if I, somebody asked me for my favorite home city, it's Washington, D.C. Right. So I'm coming from, from that perspective. Uh, our, so our goal is not entirely clear other than we're trying to answer a very simple question. Where is Montana now? What is the attitude of leaders in Montana, and particularly conservatives, because we are identified as a conservative state. Uh, so we're thinking we might uh, might do a blog, or we might do a uh, something on YouTube called Montana Voices, in which uh, those people, those few people we interviewed, will speak for Montana. Mm -hmm. and we'll obviously do some editing down. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether it's a half hour or an hour or even a set of lectures, if you would, and it depends on how well it's edited and how people respond. I think I'm prejudiced about this, right. but I still think Montanans do think a little more for themselves than most citizens. Certainly not all Montanans, but it's been a, a heartening for me. Uh, now, granted, we're thinking to select people along the way, but. Uh, it's a treasure state and uh, mentally and when I look forward 50 years hence what I suspect Montana may offer most importantly is recreation and I mean that in a philosophic sense mm -hmm. not in a superficial sense not for gearheads but for the inside of heads that the beauty here <clears throat> is something increasingly valued and increasingly of economic value right I agree and I'm anticipating that agriculture, forestry, mining will be secondary to recreation, simply because there's so much money in the rest of the world looking for this, what we have to offer. So I think um, that's I think that's right. I'm a backpacker, a hiker, a mountain biker, a fisherman. I climb mountains. I get out in the wilderness areas and the and the mountains as much as I can. And how young were you when your dad got you to the top of a mountain? About eight. So you never had a chance. I didn't have a chance. Not, That's right. He's in good shape. He's in terrific shape. And he still runs, I think, two or three times a week. And he's still, I mean, I think last, I think last summer he went backpacking and slept in the dirt, as one of his friends calls it. And I don't know if he'll get out this summer, but he still loves doing that. He was moving around there like he could go to a home. Oh, he could. Well, there's no question, you know, people in the eastern part of the state are more to the right generally, and people to the you know, western side of the state are more to the left, generally. Uh, but I'm still an optimist. Um, you know, I think Montana traditionally has kind of been a big pendulum, and it's kind of just swung back and forth. And I think really our nation has done that. We'll continue to do that because I think we get a little bit far to this side, and people start, hmm, we're a little bit far to that side, let's come more to the middle. And then go to a little bit to the other side, hmm, we're a little far to that side, let's come more to the middle. And I think that trend will continue. Uh, there seems to be a, a I, an income difference between Western Montana and Eastern Montana. Uh, have you observed that sort of pattern, and 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 how is that affecting? How, how does that affect Montana attitudes? I'm not sure that I've seen that, Dave. Um, you know, there's a lot of service industry in western Montana, but there's plenty in eastern Montana. Eastern Montana has a few more natural resources that are developed. I'm thinking of the oil industry and the coal industry, and so those wages pay pretty good. Western Montana has some good paying industry as well, and you know some technological things going on, Bozeman in particular, so I'm not sure I could really find that to be the case. No. About generation, we've been looking at this our generation versus the generation under 15 years of age. Is the separation there really profound, or do you think, as you look at the electorate, that uh, 
<clears throat> it's just a traditional thing we're going through and that the young people will become like the old people in the future. Because people are worried nationally that young yeah. people are off the rails, that they're living with this and they're not becoming human beings like we used to be. Well, I, I think one thing that's interesting in that discussion that I'm not sure I have a conclusion from, but if you look at the voter dynamics, older Montanans vote in a much higher percentage than younger Montanans. I find that to be pretty interesting because, you know, when I turned 18, the first thing I wanted to do is vote. To me, that's really important. But I think there's some that don't think it's that important, which I find fascinating and, dis and disappointing. That's certainly true nationally, but my, I guess my question is, is, is Montana resisting that national trend uh, or not? We're certainly not to the degree that the national trend is, okay. but we are trending in that direction. Do you see much difference between the high school kids in Billings and high school kids in Missoula? I don't. I, you know, we my kids just finished high school, and so we went across the state in volleyball and tennis tournaments in particular. And I don't see much difference. You know, I think people, kids want to. Most kids want to make a, a life for themselves. They want to get married and have children and have a little house with a white picket fence and be able to pay their bills and you know save a little bit for retirement and send their kids off to school. I think that's pretty much across the state. And, and, and where are they going to college? Our son's down at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and our daughter's at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma. And, and, up college. and how did they pick their those schools? You know, it's kind of a gut reaction or a feeling. They, we took them to schools on the East Coast and South and the West Coast and the Northwest, and they looked at different schools and I guess both of them just said, I think this is where I'd like to go. And so what leads that? Some sort of a feeling. They're both private Christian colleges. Is that correct? Uh, you know, they are, but I think... Um, I've been a, in the Puget Sound School. I haven't been to Southern Methodist, so I don't know what it is. I think the, the Christian influence is, is pretty small, to be honest, yeah. to both of them. Okay. Yeah. They're t tennis players? Her is daughter that? is playing tennis. They're both tennis players. Uh, they were both state champions in high school. And they both had excellent tennis careers. Uh, our daughter is playing at University of Puget Sound. And she played on the varsity and had a very good freshman year of tennis. Our son played a little bit of club tennis at SMU and had some fun, but isn't even close to good enough to be on the varsity. So, so he's not there to play tennis. No, he's not there to play tennis. No. No I, my cousin, Eddie Luthold, who you may have known. I do, yes. Uh, went to Southern Methodist. Oh, I didn't that, know that. That was his okay. school. Well, he loves it down there. He loves Dallas. He loves the school. He loves his professors. That's kind of his personality, though. He kind of loves anything that's in front of him. So, uh -huh. yeah. You know, there's a fag dynasty. It sounds like of the two of them, she may be more competitive. Uh, I, that's not a fair question to ask, and I'm not. But I... Uh, I guess I believe in family dynasties. Uh, I'm not sure. Everybody has to follow their own path. I mean, I'd love to see them come back to Montana. At this juncture, who knows? I guess it depends on who they marry and what careers they get into and all those things. I love Montana. I think it's a great place to raise a family. That's why I wanted to come back. And I hope they make that decision, but that's going to have to be their decision. My agenda in life is uh, to make the world safe for small voices. And the big voices tend to write history and uh, tend to interpret what the meaning of the life is for the little people. But in fact, over the long run, it's the small people that keep the trains running and make things happen. Right. And uh, Montana has a reputation for that, which might cause my folks to come here in the 19th century and then in the 20th century. And I come back and still what I look for, and yet, you know. Because they work so hard, and that's still the case. And I have a sense that our work ethic is significantly better than the work ethics, just as a generality, of people on the West Coast or the East Coast. Do you think that's true? I can, I can respond. Please. In, in a way, I had a, a student uh, who um, uh, 
went uh, to, to New York. He became a professor in New York. And, and he uh, continually talked about the Midwestern uh, work ethic. And, and, and he saw that as significantly different from what he was observing with people he was working with in New York. Uh, and and um, I think there is a work ethic in the center of the country. Uh, but uh, look, John, did you have an additional? Well, one? I've had a minute to think about it. Nobody's ever asked me that question. I was at Cornell for quite a while, so we had many students from all over the world, more than at UM or MSU, and certainly the work ethic in that area was good. But, uh, you know, the ragtag end of Appalachia, which is all of western Pennsylvania and western and New York, has a lot of people in trouble. Uh, when you're looking at the data on opiates, uh, it's probably higher, equivalent to reservations, and uh, the country's got a real crisis of identity. People don't work well when they have no background in craft, no skill set, uh, and I'm not sure we're doing a very good job uh, in dealing with that work ethic everywhere, and certainly not on Montana reservations, we're not doing a good job. And with that, we're reaching the end of the judge's time here.